Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to church here at Community this morning. We're glad that you're here to worship with us. Before we begin our service, I just have one uh, brief announcement, and that is that this coming Saturday, uh, April 9th at 6.30 here at the church, uh, we're going to be having what we call a connection dessert, and that's specifically designed for anyone that wants to get more connected with other people here at our church. Uh, that's an opportunity for you to come and to meet other people. There'll be some good food, and it'll be a time to, to hang out and fellowship together. So if you want, want to connect more with our church, please join us next Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 9th at 6.30. Well, to the weak who feel like you can't go on and need strength, to the wounded who are broken and long to be whole, and to the wayward who are lost and far from home, we welcome you this morning in the name of the living Jesus. If you would stand together with us, our call to worship comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3. It says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And as our welcome embraces and recognizes, there are so many of us who come to church this morning and who are doing a lot worse than we let on on the surface. And the good news that Isaiah 43 sets, the tone that it sets for our service this morning, is one in which we can come and bring all of our suffering because it declares to us that for the Lord's people, God is with us, and that gives us hope in the midst of suffering. So let's sing this song together, and let's declare and know that God is near to us.
Well, in the midst of our suffering, one of the ways that God draws near to us is that in the Bible, he actually inspires for us prayers to pray whenever we are suffering. He's given us the language to speak about the difficulty of our circumstances and our emotions living life in a fallen world. And we call those psalms, Psalms of Lament. And those psalms give us language to honestly bring our emotions before God, but they also give us a language of hope whenever we have none. They give us a way in the midst of terrible circumstances to turn to the Lord and say, this is what I am feeling, this is what I am experiencing, and yet I trust you. And so together as a church, we're going to pray one of those prayers of lament this morning by reading Psalm 13 aloud together. And let me just make one comment before we do that. You might be here this morning, and as you read these words, you might think, these words don't apply to my circumstances right now. And I would just encourage you that in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, that one, as one part of the body suffers, so we all suffer. And so if you are currently not experiencing hardship this morning, pray this prayer for the person to your left or right or behind you who is suffering and suffer alongside of them as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray this prayer out loud together. It's Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And if you see in that psalm, there is nothing in the psalmist's circumstances that changes before he declares his hope in the Lord. And so this morning, as we bring our sorrows and suffering before the Lord, we don't need our circumstances to change before we take hope in the Lord, before we trust in his steadfast love. And our encouragement on the other side of the cross of Jesus Christ is that we are assured that when we place our hope in the steadfast love of the Lord, that that hope is never in vain because Jesus has not only suffered alongside of us, he has bled and died so that one day all suffering might be removed from this earth and every tear might be wiped away from our eyes. And so let's sing a song now and let's, along with the psalmist, declare defiant hope and joy in Christ. Let's sing together. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes upon Christ. 
Good morning. My name is Janice Lilly, and this morning's Bible reading is Psalm 23. You can find it on page 428 in the Bible in the pew in front of you. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to dismiss the children ages four through kindergarten to children's church. They're going to come back up during our closing song. Well, last week, David, Pastor David, opened our study in Psalm 23, preaching the first three verses to us. And it was, as I expected, it would be like this warm bear hug from God to his children, or perhaps we should say from a shepherd to his sheep. This morning, I have verse 4. Next week, Pastor Ben will have verse 5, and then on Easter, I'll preach verse 6. We want to let you know the schedule beforehand so you can be, as we often say, reading ahead. 
But I don't think the trouble in the coming weeks will be finding the time to read one verse. The trouble, if we want to call it that, will be to get our minds around all of the goodness that God has for his sheep in each verse. However, a few aspects of the psalm, before they provide comfort, might rightly raise concerns. In verse 2, we read that the Lord, our shepherd, leads his sheep to green pastures and beside still waters. But if that is so, how could we ever find ourselves, as we read in verse 4, walking through the valley of the shadow of death? What happened to green pastures and still waters? Pastor David mentioned last week he's the best at thinking through the worst case scenarios. His mind often goes to the worst that could happen. Now in verse 4, they seem to have happened. The sun has now ceased to shine and dark clouds cast their shadow. So we should pray as we begin. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we sang earlier, you never leave our side. Drawing from those words in Romans 8, height nor depth nor anything else in all creation can separate the good shepherd from his sheep. May we feel and know the joy of that comes from that kind of relationship. As your word is preached, your gospel is sung, and your people gather. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Most of us bring a familiarity to Psalm 23 for two primary reasons. First, we come with a general familiarity with Psalm 23 because it is, well, familiar. It's been so well-loved and so well-known throughout history, even modern history, that most of us here this morning, even if you're not a Christian, even if you don't consider yourself very religious, you probably hear Psalm 23 read and you go, I think that sounds familiar. I was recently reading a book about writing and the author didn't seem to have any clear religious persuasion, at least not that he was communicating, and he was writing to an audience that he assumed to not have any clear religious persuasion. And yet, in making one of his points about writing, simply without explanation, he said that the kind of writing he was talking about is like the kind of writing found in Psalm 23. He could do that because Psalm 23 is familiar, he assumed, I think rightly. But more than general familiarity, Psalm 23, uh, we come to Psalm 23 with a familiarity because of the specific context of Christian funerals. And rightly so. If ever a passage were there for a believer's comfort and hope, it would sound like Psalm 23. In March, we have this thing called March Madness with this bracket and 64 teams, right? And if we were to put Psalm 23 in a bracket of the best passages to preach at a funeral, I dare say I'd have... Psalm 23, at least in the Sweet 16, if not the final four, and probably playing on Monday night. But this specific familiarity presents us with a problem. Preaching Psalm 23 on an ordinary Sunday. Not that I believe there's such a thing as an ordinary Sunday, the people of God gathering to sing and open up the Bible. Still, we might even say in the word so often used today that Psalm 23 can be triggering. To be triggered is to feel a strong, likely disproportionate reaction to something because of a past experience, typically bad. The cultural use of triggering can be overdone. Can be overdone, such that if you used to attend a church and in their logo was blue and orange, and then you come to our church and our logo is blue and orange and you had a bad experience at that church, well, then you come to our church and you're triggered and you're mad at me. Okay, I'm exaggerating to make a point, but the misuse of the word trigger does not invalidate the legitimate use for someone who has been abused or been through a traumatic encounter. Certain sounds like yelling or crying or shouting can be triggering. Maybe you have company over to your house on a Friday night 
And you serve beer, and then the next morning you find yourself emptying a half-drunk glass of beer down the sink. And that action and that smell bring you back to when you were 10 and you grew up with an alcoholic mother, triggered. I'll be vague, but I can remember a few years ago hearing the sound made when a person picked up car keys off a wooden table and flicked a light switch. And those two simple sounds placed one after the other caused me to feel overwhelmed with anxiety because the exact same combination of sounds brought me back to a very difficult season of ministry and a personal conflict. Now, the, the, the gifted counselors here among us could probably describe it in more technical terms than I can, but I can tell you just those two sounds were triggering. Now, as pastors, preaching Psalm 23, our hope is to give comfort. But to give comfort, we first want to acknowledge this psalm may trigger for you the memory of a death of someone you love. This winter, we had three members of our church die. And we had several more members who had others close to them die. To preach Psalm 23, even indeed to read it in your Bible reading plan can trigger hard memories. Here's what I want to say, though. If we really look at the meaning of Psalm 23, even specifically verse 4, we'll see that if at first this psalm triggers anxiety and harsh memories, if we keep our attention on what the psalm actually says, God will remind us of why we go to Psalm 23 in the first place. Because the good shepherd longs to lead us to still waters, to make us lie down, and to give us no fear. Let me read verse 4 again. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As seasons change, a shepherd in the Middle East needs to move his flock from higher ground to lower ground, or the reverse, to be either somewhere warmer or cooler, depending on the need in each season. Thus, a flock has to pass through valleys. And they're associated long, dark shadows. A flock has to pass through valleys, places where fierce animals and bandits might hide. Footing becomes more precarious even as visibility diminishes. To us, the phrase, the valley of the shadow of death, suggests hospice-type situations. It suggests the news of terminal illness and the treatment of palliative care. In the context of a hospital, palliative care means that you have to walk through the illness to the other side of death. And the hospital will be there with palliative resources, medical, emotional, and perhaps even spiritual resources to help. Where does a sheep's comfort come from in these moments? Where does your comfort come from in these moments? The evil you might fear might be actual evil, as though you fear evil people coming to get you. Or you might fear what might be also called disastrous situations. You might fear children walking away from the Lord. You might fear never finding a spouse. You might fear that for health reasons you have to retire before you're financially ready to retire. Where does your comfort come from in those moments? A very natural response in these moments, a response we might even call human nature, tends towards self-reliance. Yet it seems to me, as I read the Bible and as I experience life with God, God designed problems too big for us to expose our need for the solution bigger than us. Or we might say God has designed valleys too evil for us to expose our need for the shepherd better than us. Psalm 23 verse 4 invites us to consider Two very different approaches to evil. 
Let's talk about the two different approaches to evil. First, we'll consider the world's way of dealing with evil. The world deals with evil by looking either inward or outward, but not upward. In this inward or outward look, it only leads to more fear because we're offered solutions inadequate for the task. I'll say it again. The world's way of focusing on evil only leads to more fear because we're only offered solutions inadequate for the task. In other words... We're buried alive in this dump truck of dirt and given a teaspoon to dig our way out. Now, sometimes our human nature wants to convince ourselves that our teaspoon is up to the task. This is the inward look. I asked the guys around the office if they remembered the No Fear t-shirts from the 90s. All right. So some of you uh, were a kid in the 90s like me or had kids in the 90s, and you had no fear t-shirts. I think they're the precursor to what were the and one t-shirts of the early 2000s, which my kids don't know. Um, But they're these t-shirts that you'll know them if I describe them to you, what they were like. They're usually these braggadocious kind of, you know, bold in the face of fear type shirts, usually in the context of sports. So some of the better ones, if you Google them, they'll go something like this. Life is a contact sport, no fear. Okay, here's another one. Bottom of the ninth, down by three, bases loaded, full count, two outs, no fear. And then, classically, second place is the first loser. No fear. All right, these were the t-shirts. You get the idea. But the idea is this machismo, this self-reliance that rises above evil. No fear means beating your chest and raising your head and shouting, I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. And sure, that's fine if we're playing sports with passion and confidence. But can we not see the difference between a baseball game and stage four cancer? There was no t-shirt that said pancreatic cancer, no fear. For good reason. God has designed valleys too evil for us to expose our need for the shepherd better than us. And if one solution looks inward, another worldly solution looks outward, but to the wrong places. Where do you get your comfort? How are you medicating the evil around you and within you? Maybe you don't wear a no-fear t-shirt, but instead you eat cheeseburgers and pizza and ice cream until the pain is gone. Or maybe you'll exercise until you're thin enough that someone will love you. Or maybe ordering another cardboard box from Amazon will be the way you tell yourself the world will be okay. Maybe you medicate with a case of beer, bottle of bourbon, binge watching the latest show. Maybe you come to church every time we open the doors not to be with the good shepherd and his sheep, but because you've fashioned this bargain that you have with God that if you do the right things, he'll take care of you and you'll never suffer. Maybe you look outward to draw strength from what I'll call a guru, this hero leader who will tell you the real problems, the real solutions. Here I have in mind a leader who tells you what's wrong with the world, but does so with a result that it only cultivates more fear. This is the approach of many, although not all, news outlets. Whether in print or online or on cable television, the result of so much news that you consume describes evil and fear in such a way as to produce more fear. I'm so thankful that in America, we have the freedom of the press to a degree not experienced in many other parts of the world. I'm thankful for God, to God for journalists who write and speak about the evils they feel plague our country. What an honorable calling. But I also wonder if there is not a danger we can 
should be concerned about. If you are a conservative talk show host with an hour program to feel, feel, excuse me, fill every weeknight, what will you fill that show with to get the most viewers? Better television ratings drive more lucrative sponsors, which then feeds better ratings and more money and so on and so forth. And a cult can form where we feel like this person or that person is the real person who will tell me the real problems in our country, and they're the ones with the solution. And it's not just newscasters. The same could be said about the way some pastors shepherd their church under shepherds, fashioning themselves as the good shepherd. And whether on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, or on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 7 p.m., the world's way of dealing with fear often does nothing more than cultivate more fear. It's like taking a plant, or better, a weed, and putting it in direct sunlight, and watering it and giving it miracle growth. Not surprisingly, fear grows. And not surprisingly, I hope, Psalm 23 offers you a better way. In Psalm 23, we see the Bible's way of focusing on evil leads to no fear because we are offered the good shepherd who defeats evil. Just just leave it open if you have it there in front of you. Psalm 23, page 428, if you are using one of these Bibles in the pew. I'll read verse 4 again. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Again, the Bible's way of focusing on evil leads to comfort and no fear because we're offered the strong Shepherd God who defeats evil and carries us home, even though we must first walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You'll notice, won't you, as you let your eyes go back up into verses 2 and 3, we read of God described as He. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. How am I so well fed? How am I so restored? How is my sin and depravity so lavishly addressed with grace? Oh, it's him, that shepherd over there. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Notice now in verse 4, we are no longer talking about him the shepherd over there, but you. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In the valley of the shadow of death. We do not talk about our good shepherd. We talk to our shepherd. You, your, because he's with us. We don't point at a shepherd off in the distance, but rather like a young child crossing the street at Times Square, we hold up a hand and the hand of the good shepherd grabs our hand and walks us to the other side, home. The true and greatest palliative care. Don't look inward or outward, but upward. A rod is for defense and a staff for direction. A rod and a staff in my hands might not be so comforting to you. But in the hands of the one who redeemed Israel out of the hand of Pharaoh, they bring comfort. We call Jesus Emmanuel, which means God's with us because he is with us. That's why we call him that. We should not reduce Christianity to mere experience. But neither should we reduce it to mere doctrine. Paul writes to the church in Rome, For the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
Psalm 23 offers you not just the truth of a good shepherd in the valley of the shadow of death, but the experience of the good shepherd. And there's more to the presence of Jesus with you than mere experience. It gets better. We read, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Biblically speaking, for God to be with us, and that language, that's loaded, charged language in the scriptures. The presence of God is not there for experience and comfort only, but also for empowerment. In Exodus, God comes to Moses in a fiery bush that doesn't burn. And he says in chapter 3, verse 12, I am with you. Which was, of course, to bring peace and comfort. But what immediately follows that is the statement, I'm with you to get God's people, my people, out of Egypt. Empowerment. You're going to do stuff. In the book of Joshua, after Moses had died, God tells Joshua, just as I was with Moses... So I will be with you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua chapter 1. God's presence is for peace, but also for empowerment. Perhaps closer to our context, consider the words of our Savior at the end of Matthew's gospel. Jesus rose from the dead, defeating evil, and then he tells his followers this, quote, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, he says, to the end of the age. Now let's come back to Psalm 23. King David wrote Psalm 23, but he wrote it to be collected. He wrote it to be collected so that it could be sung and cherished by all God's people. He wrote it for a hymn book. You think about that. I could write something for a private prayer journal for me, but if I write something for a hymn book, what does that say? This is for you, is what it says. What is God telling you that he is there with you right now to empower you to do? Walking through a challenging business situation, a family problem, a health challenge that feels like the shadow of death. That's okay. Fear no evil. Because Jesus lived and died and rose and loves you and is with you always, even to the end of the age. So how shall we end this sermon? Page and a half left. How shall we end? This week, I want to give, I want to end by giving something of a brief explanation and defense for why we do what we do on Sunday mornings and why we don't do what we don't do on Sunday mornings. I hope as you come week after week, you get a good sense of what we do on Sunday mornings. But it might be helpful to state it it outright. The main aim of Sunday mornings is to keep our attention riveted on the Good Shepherd. And if we expose evil whether out there, somewhere, or in here, it's to expose our need for that shepherd and to see his provision to us. The late pastor and author Eugene Peterson wrote several books about Christian ministry. In one place he writes, the biblical fact is that there are no successful churches. There are instead Communities of sinners gathered before God week after week in towns and villages all over the world. In these communities of sinners, one sinner is called pastor. I would encourage him to say several are called pastors. Because in the New Testament, we always read of pastors, but 
We'll forgive Eugene Peterson. He says, one of these sinners is called pastor and given a designated responsibility in a community. The pastor's responsibility is to keep the community attentive on God. It is this responsibility that is being abandoned in spades. I know most weeks we don't say anything about the dozens of issues that feel so electric in our news. This week, I'm not talking about how Will Smith slapped Chris Rock at the Oscars last Sunday. (laughs) Except to say, I'm not talking about it. I'm not saying much about Russia and Putin and Ukraine, even though this concerns me. I don't often say much about transgender ideology. I haven't said anything about Leah Thompson, a biological male who recently won the women's 500-yard women's freestyle race in the NCAA National, Division I National Championships. I've not said anything about Leah, despite the connection to a Pennsylvania school. And speaking of Pennsylvania, I've never said anything about our former secretary of the Department of Health, Dr. Rachel Levine. And I've never talked about the demonic evil that it is when I'm told that it's a good thing for a biological male to transition and compete in women's mixed martial arts. I never say anything about that. Now, some of you might wonder at your deepest level, could I be the wrong gender? And I'm not saying you're evil any more than any of us are evil. We are all, as we say at the start of every one of our services, weak, wounded, and wayward. I just don't say much about all of this on Sundays because I fear most commentary about evil cultivates More fear, at least the way we ordinary hear it talked about. I don't really know a way to talk about all that evil every week that doesn't produce more fear. Except I do. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. The life and death and promise of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, enables us to talk about evil when we need to and to name the evil out there in the world and the evil in here in our hearts because the good shepherd has a solution that's bigger than our fear and bigger than the evil. Your comfort will not come from a slogan on a t-shirt or a cheeseburger or a faster marathon or a case of beer or career advancement, but only from Christ. And it's this reminder, this reminder, the reminder of the endurance of the word of God, the weakness and woundedness and waywardness of man, the transcendence of God, the assurance of the final judgment to right all wrongs, and the amazing grace of Jesus that we want to give you. We want to give it to you as a gift each Sunday. We believe that those who gather on Sunday for that, who gather mainly to rivet our attention upward on the good shepherd, will be the most empowered to live out there for all of that other stuff. Those who rivet our attention on Christ will fear no evil even in the valley of the shadow of death. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome, that your kingdom It's a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Lord, we have barely tasted all that that could mean for us. 
And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us to know that truth more in our heads and in our hearts. That your presence would be with us so that we could go out and live for you. In Christ's name we pray. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing a song now of hope and joy as we take our stand on Christ, our hope. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. Well, at this time, uh, I'm going to invite Volker to come on up here, and uh, Volker and I are going to be joined up on stage by Tim Spears. Uh, Tim and his wife, Bethany, are partners of ours uh, in the Lord. They're, they uh, 
recently just moved back to the States from the Philippines, but they're still working in the Philippines, and we're going to hear more from, from Tim about that this morning. But I want to just briefly, before we hear from Tim, just talk about what, what we're doing here whenever we, we hear from one of our missionary partners. It's, it's our belief that, that we all as Christians are called to be missionaries in our own individual ways. We are all called to bring the gospel to people, but we feel burdened that we need to partner with people who are trying to do that cross-culturally, to bring the gospel to places that are very different than Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to people very different than our neighbors. And so Tim and Bethany are one of those partners, and we as a church believe that it is so valuable to hear from them in person, in the flesh. Not just for us to talk about what's going on with these abstract folks that work in the Philippines, but to bring them in front of us and say, Tim is a partner with us in the gospel, to hear what he's doing, to encourage him, to have him be encouraged by us, and to further that partnership in the gospel, the types of partnerships that we hear talked about all throughout the New Testament. And so once a quarter, we are going to begin hearing from our missionaries. We had uh, the Lewises, Mark and Denise, here uh, back in January, and now we have Tim and Bethany here today. And so that's something you can expect to see more in the regular rhythm of the life of our church so that we might all engage with our missionary partners more. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're privileged, as Ben said, Excuse me to have Tim and Bethany here with us uh, today. You'll see Bethany and the girls probably a little bit later. And uh, he's got a table out in the foyer as well between services. If you'd like to ask some more questions and so on and so forth, please uh, avail yourself of that. But Tim, uh, we're doing, doing a little interview kind of style here this morning. Uh, tell us a little bit about your family. You know, we've seen your picture on the wall for a while. Uh, who are you? Are you real? Yeah, you're real. <laughs> It's not just a picture on the wall. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, my name is Tim, and then my wife's name is Bethany, and we have two girls, Carmichael and Rosie, and we have a German shepherd named Bonbon, bon, and we, we are able to bring them all out to Harrisburg, so Bonbon's bon's at the Aikens, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're a normal, normal family. We love fitness, being outside, the outdoors, cooking, grilling, um, at Frisbee, so yeah, we're, we're, that's pretty much... Tell us a little bit about your ministry and what you're doing, what you're excited about uh, in the Philippines and now back here. You're, you're back here probably permanently, if I can say yeah, that. Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, we went to the Philippines as traditional missionaries to, to teach. Our first term we were in outside of Manila, if, if you're familiar with the Philippines, and we were teaching in a seminary. We, we taught there for two years. And then we, the Lord really was calling us to, to the provincial uh, regions of the Philippines. There's a lot of seminaries in, in Manila and Cebu, the two largest cities. But there's a, a huge gap with um, training leaders in the province. And one of the biggest difficulties that we noticed was that uh, for, for, for church planners and leaders to get formal education, which is really necessary and needed, no doubt you're benefiting from it here, they would leave the province and come to, the, to, to Manila, and it would be a four- to five-year process. They would set up roots. They'd get involved in a church, and they just they wouldn't go back. And, it, and it's not a, a negative reason. It's just that's just the reality of it. And so we really felt called to the province to, to equip leaders in their context, and then, and, and then we would see gospel movements occurring there because they, they wouldn't leave. So we went to, um, if you love World War II history, we went to the island of Leyte, uh, uh, Leyte Samar, and Tacloban is where MacArthur returned. I shall return, he returned in Tacloban. So that's kind of a historical fact. So we, we moved our family there. We were there for one year. We had started one class, and we had set up a, a home, and then COVID happened. And so I was thinking, like, there, the Philippines had a full lockdown. I mean... We had QR codes. You had to get passes just to leave the neighborhood. It was it was the whole the whole nine. So I was just thinking, okay, we'll just stay at home and learn the language. There's not we can't do anything. And our students were like, no, let's go online like everyone else is doing. And and I didn't believe. I, I was I was one with little faith. But 
we went online and, and we, ha we did have the hardware and, and the software and my background's a little bit in tech. So yeah, so that was, that was two years ago, March of, literally two years, March of 2020. We, we've been, we were teaching full-time online two to three classes every, every semester. And um, the big idea that we're just really passionate about is we're reimagining uh, theological education, resource development, and networking in the, in the internet space. And so we're calling it the Cloud Project and just reimagining what we can do. Uh, we're no longer bound by time, weather, because if, if we can do it well, um, between, between videos on YouTube, classrooms in Facebook, and, and various other apps, um, it's just, there's just, there's so much power. So we're really passionate about that. Our biggest struggle though, and, and what really brought us back to the US is that, um, and, and we all know this, right? You, you can get a drop call and that's not a big deal, but if the host, if, if, Google, if Google's servers go down, everyone loses that, that service. And so from our perspective, we noticed with whether we're, we're leading a workshop or a, a, a session, if, if I went down, and, and I went down often, like, we lost everything. We lost the recording, we lost the class, and then we actually had a period of three weeks where we lost either internet or power each week. And so we lost three weeks of the class. And so then all that momentum that was generated, we lost students from it. And the wildest thing was like, it was literally located to our neighborhood. So everyone else in the city had power and internet. It was just us. So we really, all of our partners, including ourselves, realized that from an infrastructure perspective, from a, from a, 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 a hosting perspective, we would be most effective here and then travel. And so our plan is actually to be based in southeast Pennsylvania. We're uploading gigabytes, no problems. It's been it's been a dream since we've been back. So we've we've since finished one class. We've started a new class, and so that's really the way forward for us. And then once the Philippines opens up, I'll travel several times a year, even my wife and I. And just but when we travel, we won't be teaching. It'll just be a time of fellowship and just really spending time with the students. So. I don't want to say it's pie in the sky because there are issues we're working through because we're obviously remote, um, but we just see that as a way forward. And we're not poo-pooing the traditional system. It, it's really a, a both and approach. And so we're just, we're one cog in, in a much bigger picture, so. So how can we as a church here support you better? How can we be helping in yeah. some way? So uh, number one, through prayer. Uh, that's the, that's the biggest way, way we, we've seen spiritual, like literally spiritual opposition, like beyond random stuff breaking or, or issues with the class. So I would definitely say the biggest thing that you can do is just pray for us. We have prayer cards out, out in, the, in the, fo the foyer. Um, <laughs> and so, so no, take, yeah, take, take, take a prayer card, pray for us. Um, we are all over, we, we're developing our, our presence on social media. So we actually have a we have a cloud prayer team, Facebook. It's a private page. We, we, we post what we're doing, and that's a way to keep in, um, in connection with us. So you could always join our private prayer team. Um, yeah, you can reach out and, and talk to us. It doesn't have to be spiritual, right? So, it, you know, we like fitness. We like dogs and food of that nature. So you can, you can reach out and talk to us like we're normal, okay? So I, maybe that's the big, you know, that's the big, the big thing. So, so th those type of things. I would say fr from, a, from a, a ministry perspective, we're, we're trying to just set down roots and just, we just um, develop rhythms and then just posting content. So from that perspective, there are other opportunities that I'm sharing with Volker down the pipeline, if I can use that word. Um, but, but right now we're just trying to get established. So prayer and then just encouragement would probably be the biggest too. Yeah. Well, great. Let's take some time to pray for, for Tim. And uh, Bethany, Lord, thank you so much for this uh, young family, for all that you've done in their lives, uh, both individually, as a couple, as a family, Lord, protecting them in the Philippines during COVID, a uh, time of isolation and not knowing what's going on next. Lord, you have been our sustainer, all of us, but uh, especially for them. And Lord, how you open the door, you open the door that no man can shut in the midst of this seemingly dark time. And uh, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. We do ask for encouragement for them. I ask you to help them to find a, a home here in, uh, in Pennsylvania that would 
that would suit their needs, Lord, and bring around them uh, team members and help us to be a much more of a support and encouragement to them. Lord, it's exciting to have them close by. And uh, we give you all the glory. We pray that your name would go forth. We pray that the students would not only learn about you, but get to know you from your word, Lord, a deep relationship so that they can share that then with their congregations and uh, those that they have influence with. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Tim and Volker. As we close this morning, uh, hear this word of, of blessing from Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Church, King Jesus has authority today. And by the power of his Holy Spirit, he is with you and allows you and I to step out into this world as his witnesses without fear. He will never leave us or forsake us. You're dismissed.